well, there's a small little application that's called Read Elf that you can actually go and look at the format in there. It will spit out all kinds of different information. So it will show you what the headers are, what the program headers are, what the different sections are, symbol tables, file attributes, etc., etc. One of these outputs looks like this. Um, I'm actually not entirely sure if the Windows machine will have Read Elf on them, but if not, yeah, go to a Linux machine. Most of them have Read Elf um, installed. This particular case, this example.o file has nine different sections. Um, it has an empty section at the beginning, which has zero size. Then we have a text section, we have a data section, the PSS section, and a couple of other um, tables and files that, that are sections in, in the ELF instruction itself. So now what can we do with this object file? Well, we can give it to a linker. And the linker will now replace all these different tags and symbols with the right memory locations. So the linker has a couple of different um, parameters that you can give it that you can also store in a linker script. So in this case, they are spelled out specifically. So what we tell it that the text section that we have seen over here, the dot text section, whatever is written in there, should be put at address zero. And we want the BSS section to start at address 2000. Any idea of what the address zero means and the address 2000 means? Could they be any number? Could I put in here zero, for example, two? What would happen with that? Any ideas so far? Yeah, so horrible things would happen, yes. So the linker script will probably oblige and actually do this for you. But the problem is that the real, in reality, your physical hardware will probably not accept this file, or it would just not execute, or nothing would happen at all. So the 2000 here is actually very specific for the co ARM Cortex that we are using. At 2000 is where the memory RAM sits. So that's where the RAM memory sits, where you can store in variables, have very quick access to. It's very, very fast. While at a zero, remember, that's where we have to store our first initial stack pointer and the jump address into. And that's usually where the code is sitting. So the text section is where all the program code is. So that you write at address zero and continue from there on. So the linker has a really important job here. It takes different object files and actually places them in the right memory locations inside of your architecture. Yes? So does the RAM count up or does it count down? Up. This is what a linker script looks like. So instead of giving all the parameters to the linker on the command line, which can sometimes be very tedious, you write a linker script. This is a very simple linker script. So what you tell it in here is you have a memory location, specifically RAM. RAM is read, write, and executable. The origin is at 2000, and we have 64K of it. And now, down here in the sections table, you can now tell where you want to put each section of your code. So in this case, we want the dot .text section. We want it aligned to a four-byte um, interface. So this is a one word. It has to be word aligned. And it then selects all the different text sections that we have. It sets a label to the end of where text stops. And it will put this into the RAM memory location. As I said, this is an extremely simple one. Um, we will look at more complicated ones later on and also in lab, where you can not stuff not, uh, put stuff not just into RAM, but also into ROM. And usually into ROM, you only store stuff that's constant, so either executable or readable, but usually not modifiable, because <coughs> modifying ROM is either impossible to do if it's burnt in, or if it's flash memory, you have to use specific functions to actually go and modify your flash. So usually, ROM is only re um, read and executable, while RAM is read, write, and executable. So what does then an executable image contain? So this is the image that you get out from a linker script. Well, it certainly still has the .text section, and um, this is the executable code, and has also the initial reset vector in it. And um, you then often have a .data segment, or a RO data section. So RO data is usually only read-only data, while um, .data sections sometimes can be writable. Um, this is the static part. It's initialized variables. So whenever you have a variable in your C code, 
that will go into the data section because it is data that has to be read and has to be initialized in, a, um, in the beginning of the startup of your application. Then the .bss segment is basically all the variables that you define that get used that are not initialized. So what happens with a variable in C code if you don't initialize it? Who knows? If you have a variable that you have not initialized and you start using it without assigning anything to it. Yes? Yes. So it's not guaranteed that an uninitialized variable is actually zero. It's not guaranteed. Now, many systems try to do it. So because these variables sit all in the BSS, what oftentimes happens is that your OS goes into that section in the very beginning of the startup of your application and just writes zeros all over the place, making sure that everything is zero. But it's not guaranteed that this really happens. Yes, it does depend. Oh, sometimes that's when stuff becomes complicated. So the compiler then decides, do I really need a location somewhere or not? So for example, global variables that you're using, even if they're int something, and they will most likely be a 32-bit integer um, or assigned to a 32-bit integer, they will sit somewhere in memory. So it will create a BSS entry for it. And then later on, it will just use that particular memory location wherever you use this variable. So you, you will see that all in, in your code um, next week. The key to this is also that it does not include a heap or a stack, because that's sitting usually in RAM, and you have to make sure that whatever is in the BSS section does not collide with your stack itself. So then how do you read one of these files? Once you went through the linker, you get a .out file. Well, it's exactly the same thing as before. It's, you can just use um, the read hex and uh, read elf, and you will get the output of an out file. So then what really changed? Well, if you look at it, and the same application that we had before, if we first went from the .s file to the .o file, we had nine sections, if you remember. Now, all of a sudden, we only have six sections left. Anybody know why? Why do we only have six sections left? What happened to the other sections? There are three sections that disappear. They were not important. Right? The linker now sees that, oh, these sections are not even used. And in the linker script, we didn't link them back into our sections. So they will not be put into the .out file anymore. Any questions? So here comes now the cool part. If you actually look at all these different files, you can actually start seeing the things that you wrote. And you now start to understand how this stuff is put into these binary files. And at the end, you really can read out, again, what your assembly instructions are. That's basically what a disassembler does, right? So if you use the read elf with a dash x, we actually get a hex dump, which just means it's translating whatever is in binary written in there into as a hex output. <coughs> and what we can see is, if you lose the hex dump, first initial part is the dot text section. Interestingly, Recognize this number here? Stack pointer. But, really? yes, it's in little end here. It's 2000800800. Right? Goes from least significant to most significant thing. The next thing here, we have seen this number before, right? It tells us that it's a thumb instruction because it's a 9 and not an 8, but this is the reset vector jump address, right? Like it's the start of where we start off at memory address 8. And that's here. And now if you want to go into details, you could start decoding this using the arm arm and actually figure out what all the different opcodes are and what they represent <coughs> as assembly instructions. And that's really what all this assembler does. It just has a huge table of all the codes that are possible and it will do the reverse of what's written in this file. It's not too hard. A little bit laborious, but not too hard for an application to do. So what's the raw data really looking like? Well, if you do a hex dump on the example one dot out, you will first see a big block of stuff that has what's called the elf magic number. If you have ever used a Linux system, if you type type and then the file name, 
it will try to identify what this file is. Many of file types actually have what's called a magic number, so it will always have the same number here at the top telling you this is an ELF file. And then down here, you can see the same stuff again. Do you notice something? Slightly different than from what we have seen before, right? It's now in half words, little endian. Instead of byte wise, it's now half words. So we have 2000 and then 0800. Sometimes very confusing to figure out little endian, what's what. Sometimes it's really on per bytes, sometimes it's on half words. So you have to be careful of what you're looking at. So what's the purpose of this executable file? Well, it basically serves as a container before you really put it into applications that can program your microcontrollers. Um, they keep different segments partitioned with different access rights. Um, they serve as an image for operating systems. So if you have ever um, upgraded your Linux router, for example, or like your Wi-Fi routers, um, you usually get one of these images, and then you take this image and program it into your microcontrollers. They oftentimes have um, debugging information, so your IDE can actually find out what's written where and actually find the link back into your C code. That's all stored in this executable file. So how useful are these executable files? Why do we even have them? Why not just use the binary files only? Any idea? What's an advantage of having this huge container with all kinds of information in it? When all you really need is the binary file, right, to program your microcontrollers. Because that's really what's getting uploaded into the flash memory, where everything starts. Yes. These executable files are really important for debugging. Because without them, you don't really know what's going on or what the different C instructions mean. So the executable file is really the link between your C code, your assembly code, your source files, and what's written in your binary file later on. So then, what does a binary file have in it? So once you send it through object dump, you can look at it again, and no big surprise really, right? We have the stack pointer, the first jump address, and after that comes your program. So it's gonna be sitting in code and gets executed as you tell the machine to do. If you want to, you can now, since you understand opcodes, you can actually use hex edit and go and edit this binary file. And if you have ever, back in the day, I'm not sure how computer games work these days still, but back in the day you could oftentimes just go and edit your .exe files in Windows or Linux and you could go and screw around with your lives and have um, tell it that well, actually you have 100 lives to start off and not just one if you knew where it is and stuff like that. So that's, that's exactly what's happening here, right? This is the code that's gonna get written into the flash memory. And if you want, you can now go and edit this code and do something else. This is oftentimes how um, people crack phones. They go and look at the binary files. They actually go and read these binary files, to, binary files, disassemble them, and then find out which function they have to go and change to actually circumvent certain protections. By understanding what's going on in the binary files, you can figure it out. So oftentimes, these binary formats are not very useful, unfortunately. Oftentimes, programs don't use them. There are two other formats that are way more common. That's the Intel hex format, or iHex, or the other one is the Motorola S records. Fortunately, object dump can produce both of them, so you can tell it to do a binary file, an iHex file, or an S record file. It's just, they all have more or less the same content in them, except that some of them are ASCII, others are pure binary files. So for example, if you generate a hex file, the content looks something like this, with a different notation. If you use an SREC file, a Motorola file, the stream is just encoded differently. More or less the same information, just in ASCII and in different formats. All right, um, we have about 20 more minutes. So we now looked at the C assembly flow, or how we go from assembly into our binary files. So let's go to one step further and ha see what happens if you have C, right? So we have seen this one here, where we have the assembly file, use the assembler, object file, linker, linker script, generates the executable. This is the big container with all the information that you really want for debugging and programming, et cetera, et cetera. And then from here, you can use object copy to 
generate binary files or hex files or the other type of ASCII files that then your tool will use to program into your microcontroller. Or you can go all the way back to here and actually disassemble the whole thing. If we add C into the picture, it gets more complicated. And now we add a tool that's called GCC that does a lot of magic for you. Instead of having the linker in here, you use GCC. And GCC takes C files, takes object files that were generated with an assembler, or it can also use libraries that were written as objects before, takes all of them together using a linker script, invokes the linker on the side, and generates your executable image. So GCC is really this magic box that does most of the things for you. And one last thing, um, if you really need to add assembly into your C code, there's a small little trick that you can use with the statement underscore underscore ASM that will execute assembly code. It's a little bit tricky on how the notation is because imagine that the problem now is you have assembly code and C code, you have to, them to work together. So you somehow have to tell the assembler what your input is and what do you get out from your assembly code. Because in assembly you don't have variables, really. You have registers. But in C code you have now variables. But you don't really know where all these variables are stored at which point in time. So how to do this is with this notation down here, where you can say that you have the different output variables that's stored in a register, you have an input variable that's stored in a register, and you have the cobbler list of R3, <coughs> which is basically the regist you tell it which registers it can use that don't have to mean anything after this execution anymore. So it can use the R3 as a throwaway later on. So what happens is output, input are two variables that we have here. There are unsigned integers, input and output. And it will take them, store them in a register, and it will output it, it will take input, store it in a register, and will output that register back into the output itself. So that way your assembler actually knows and can now decide which registers it really wants to use at the position of percent zero and percent one, optimize this for the current execution of the, the code itself. So if you want to actually try this out, you can write this into a C file. You can use GCC to compile it down, and you can see there's no assembler in here. So GCC actually knows how to deal with the assembly code. And you can then use QEMU, which is an emulator, and for ARM, um, especially works fairly easily on Linux. You just can up get it and install it. And then you tell QEMU what CPU you're running, and it will actually output stuff for you. And... I think that's it. Yep. Any questions so far?